Hello, everyone. Welcome to what used to be the 21 Hats podcast and is now the Business Advantage TV podcast. I'm your host, Lauren Feldman. In last week's episode, I asked our panel of business owners this question. Would you be doing anything differently with your business if you knew for sure that a second shutdown order was coming? It seemed like a pretty straightforward question to me, but it triggered one of our guests, Jay Goltz, who called it stupid and encouraged the other panelists not to answer it. I was so taken aback by Jay's response that I did a poor job of explaining why I thought the question was legitimate and important. I really didn't know where to begin. So this week, we decided to take another crack at it, one-on-one, Jay and me, to see if we could get on the same page. And at least to some extent, I think we succeeded. I think we get a better understanding of how Jay is coping with these stressful times. That said, I still think Jay's somewhat in denial. There's a part of him, it seems to me, that continues to believe that so long as his employees and his customers wear masks, He and his business will be fine, no matter how much the pandemic rages around the country. But maybe that confidence helps explain why Jay's been a successful entrepreneur for more than four decades. As Jay likes to say, there's a thin line between being a visionary and being delusional. He acknowledges he's been on both sides of that line. The episode is titled Doomsday Fatigue. First of all, I just want to point out that you and I have known each other for a long time. I think, you know, it's definitely more than 10 years, maybe 14 now. You know, we met at Inc. Magazine and uh, when I went to the New York Times, you came along and uh, you were my lead blogger. We must have worked together on, I don't know, hundreds of of blog posts. So I feel like I've I've had a pretty good window into the way you think, the way you run your business, and yet uh, you you took me by surprise last week when we taped last week's episode. Uh, I asked you a question that that kind of seemed to trigger you a little bit. The question was uh, that I asked, if you knew uh, that we were going to go into another shutdown, would you be doing anything differently right now? And uh, we've had a chance to think about it uh, over the past week. We've talked about it a little bit. Um, Can you tell me now, what was it about that question uh, that got to you? So in hindsight, yeah, it took me a few minutes talking to you to, okay, fair enough. But so I do know myself to know what what happened? Like I, I, my nerves were a little shot. It's been 15 weeks, and I, after that, I did consult a doctor. I talked to Dr. Nick Riviera, and um, he, he says I'm. Sub- Wait, where where do I know that name from? Um, he does a lot of TV work on The Simpsons. Uh, um, he diagnosed it as doomsday fatigue that I have. <laughs> Is that a real phrase from The Simpsons? Yeah. No, I just made that one up. Okay. But Doomsday, Dr. Nick, I, I have Doomsday fatigue. I got to tell you. What is that? I'm just a little worn out. You, you watch TV and like all they want to do is get the headline. So they said, here's an example. They go, this is the highest unemployment since the depression. You shut the businesses down. How could it not be the hot? I mean, one has nothing to do with the other. We're going to talk about this. I don't know if we want to dive into it right now. Okay. But but the point is, everything is doomsday. Oh, my God, this isn't going to recover for five years. And I think just hearing about if it comes back, it's like, we don't know that it's going to come back. I'm, I'm not arguing. With you. It was a fair question, I guess. But I, I'm just I'm just every day I got to deal with it. And then on top of that. And I don't want I don't I hate whining and I'm not whining. I'm just saying it the way it is. We went from the pandemic to the riots in Chicago. It's been a challenging time, to say the least. I wouldn't say I'm burned out. I wouldn't say I'm stressed out. The whole thing's disorienting. Every day I'm dealing with new stuff that like who would have ever imagined? Oh, your business is going to be shut down for 12 weeks and you're going to have to figure out how to reopen. And then your employees are going to be freaked out because they're all afraid of getting sick. And then some of them are making more money sitting at home on unemployment. It's just been a whole new game and I'm dealing with it and I'm navigating it. And I'm happy to say things are going nicely. We open businesses back. But um, yeah, it caught me at a, a, an odd moment. And yes, I was trigger happy. So let's go back to the question that triggered you. I think another way of asking it would have been, and maybe this would have been a better way, uh, are you doing anything now that you would regret if we had to shut down again? Absolutely. You know what? In a calm state a week later, if you ask me that question. Well, I'm asking you now. Are you? 
Okay, I'll tell you. Um, yeah, I had an opportunity to take over another store, and um, I thought that it was a it was a great opportunity, and I thought long and hard about it. And I said to myself, "We talked a little bit about it. You mentioned it on the podcast. You were you were that that seemed like a tempting opportunity. It, it was, and I realized that at this stage of my career, if what I do is called a career, I need to 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 make more money less than I need to lose money, and. Um, I just decided, I don't know what's coming in a few months. And I, like I said, I'm doing nicely now. We're paying, you know, business is back. I'm, I'm getting more headroom in, in my, 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 my credit line. I don't need to, I've, my entire career of 42 years, I'm always one step out there. I'm always just chasing the next opportunity. And I decided that I made a deal with the guy. I'll work with you to get some of your business to me, but I don't need another store. I don't need five more employees. Meaning you're going to pay him for access to his clients? Yes. And I'll tell you the other thing I'm doing now that I, frankly, your question made me think about this. I am continuing to try to get another bank line. Part of me, I've kind of worked my way out of the cash line. I'm, I'm okay. I really don't need it. But I realize I just as soon have it because if things get bad again, I'm going to need it. And the, the, the mistake I made, I've only made one major mistake in the last couple of years. I kept thinking, you know, the phrase dry powder, meaning you've got some cash on the side. I have a building with no mortgage on it. So I always thought, oh, I got dry powder, no problem. Well, Good luck trying to get a loan on a building when the world's falling apart and all the banks look at you if you're a retailer like you're going out of business. So I have been trying for three months to get a mortgage on the building and I can't get one. So now that things are getting better, I think I'll be able to get a loan and I'm going to take the loan because I'd rather have a loan and have the cash. I can always pay it back. That's interesting. You know, there are a lot of people who reflexively think that taking on debt like that is the riskiest thing you can do. And you're saying this isn't even my opinion. This is the way business works. Cash is why you go broke. You don't go broke because you have bank debt or any. You go broke because you run out of cash. I'd rather have the cash. I can always pay it back. You know, they say cash is king. Cash is king. I'd rather have another mortgage and have the cash sitting somewhere than need the cash and not be able to get the cash. So so going back to that uh, question again, it, coming at it from a slightly different angle, um, do you have it? Take a different angle. Keep trying different angles until you piss me off. Go ahead. That's what I'm here for. Give me your best shot. I know the numbers in Chicago are pretty good right now. Very good. But it's exploding around the country. I think cases are rising in 45 states. Um, you know, th there's no guarantee that any place is uh, is safe from uh, a continuation of the first wave or a, uh, a second wave. So let me ask you this. Is there any question in your mind about whether you should have opened up when you did? I mean, th just to put this in perspective, yeah, I, I don't think this is the case for you. But with a with a restaurant, for example, that, that would be a very real concern to reopen a restaurant. You've got to buy a lot of food. you got to clean the place. you got to do all rehire people. you got to do all kinds of things to get ready. And then if you shut down again two weeks later. And people aren't wearing masks. That's the difference. In a restaurant, you can't eat and have a mask on. So there is more exposure there. They're not wearing masks. Is there any question in your mind about whether uh, it was the right thing to do to, to reopen? Uh, or if you have to close down again, you just have to close down again? Um, a, all my employees are wearing masks. All the customers are wearing masks. We have plastic shields everywhere. And I have a person that's cleaning up constantly. So I think, I think we're in good shape. Something could happen, but I feel like, but, but that's not necessarily responsive to my question. You're talking about what you're doing in your operation. And I'm sure you're being as careful as you can be. But despite that, you could get a second wave in Chicago and it could be out of your hands. You could be forced to shut down. I wouldn't regret opening because there's no downside to being open. You didn't have to put, spend a lot of money to reopen. No, I've got the image. It's not like a restaurant where you right. bought food and stuff. I, I, I hope that it doesn't happen. And I will tell you, even back three, four months ago when Karen said, I guarantee it's coming there. And I kind of flipped out on that because it's like, what do you mean you guarantee it? Now that I've seen this play out, I understand where she was coming from. You know, until you've seen it, it's truly hard to get your hands around, uh, your head around this. So no, I'm taking it at one day at a time. And um, I think it won't get shut down again, but I can't be sure of it. And um and I'll tell you what's helped my head a lot. I stopped watching the news. It's just, it, it makes you crazy. And I'm so glad you said that. That's, 
I, I think that's that's another interesting point that I want to get at. You've said often, I mean, you, you, you just you can't worry about every eventuality, every possible thing that could go wrong. You'd never be able to get out of bed in the morning, let alone build a business. And, and I understand that. And yet there's there's a line somewhere because you do need to know the facts. You need to know what's going on. Okay, I wa- I lied. I watch it, uh, it when I work out in the morning for a little bit. I watch half an hour. That's it. But but more than that, okay, to sing the same thing. Oh, and then sing the nonsense of people getting in large crowds without masks on. That's why we're having this problem. And I'll tell you what else is is wearing on me a little bit. I read articles from business owners, and they say things like, "Well." I couldn't get my employees to come back to work. They're making more money on unemployment. This is exactly what a guy said. And I don't feel like it's my right to take money away from them. And then later in the article, he says, I might be closing the business. And I just want to scream like, for God's sakes, business owners out there, your number one responsibility is staying in business so you and your employees have somewhere to go to work every day. To suggest that it's not right to call your employees back to work because they're making more on unemployment, how is that going to help anybody when they're all out of work and you're out of business? Or, or even just when the end of July comes and they stop getting the extra $600 a week. Yeah, and, and this wasn't one per. I read an article, it was like three or four of them, all lamenting about how you know they can't get... And then one says, I don't think it's right to get them to come back for my own enrichment. What is being the boss if it's not for your own? That's like, that's what your job is. You're supposed to have people work for you so you can make money in your business. That's the definition of owning a business. It's just, and I say, I hate to see people go out of business and I hate to see people put themselves out of business. And I see people doing stuff all over the place that I say to myself, okay, you just, you just uh, cast your fate. You're going out of business. I'd like to go back to something else that you said several times uh, on the podcast that kind of stopped me uh, in my tracks. And that is when we first started talking about reopening, when I asked you about the warnings that I was hearing from the epidemiologists, from the medical experts, your answer uh, several times was, oh, you know, those medical experts, they, they get a paycheck every week. They don't understand. Explain that to me. It's first of all, it's an extremely difficult decision to open because nobody wants anybody to get sick. And I certainly don't want to do anything irresponsible for them or for me or for the customers. But it's easy to be a doctor. Here, I'll give you an example. A lawyer, if you ask a lawyer about making a decision of anything, they'll say, oh, don't do it. You can get sued for that. You know, if you ask somebody in the emergency room, maybe you shouldn't drive a car because look at all the car accidents in here. So you ask a doctor, should we open? Oh, no, somebody could get sick. I meant they get a paycheck every Friday. They don't have to worry about paying their bills every week. So it's easy for them to just say, oh, no. Wait, but, but do you really think that that's what they're thinking? No, no. I wonder where the line is, though. I mean, should we, we? We obviously can't wait until the very last person has it. Couldn't the line be on the other side of f- following the guidelines? Sure, absolutely. I'm not at all suggesting we should be, you know, open too early. I'm just saying. <laughs> But you were sort of suggesting it at the time. No, no. I was suggesting that the doctors just keep saying, oh, we're, we shouldn't open. But I've never heard. They, they weren't saying never. They weren't saying never. They were saying, let's follow these guidelines. I'm following the guidelines. I believe in the guidelines. I support the guidelines. You might be. But that, you know, it makes a big difference if around the country, entire states are not. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Nick said I didn't have to talk to you too long about this because <laughs> yeah. it was harming my health. So I just. <laughs> okay. All right. He says I need to get some support and nurturing from you a little bit, he said. <laughs> you always do, Jay. I'm looking out for your business. No, I, I want to understand how you think because I know uh, there are a lot of people um, who, who th- approach this the same way. You know what? I'm going to give you it's, – it's really at this point, it's half about what you think and it's half emotions because this has been an extremely trying time. So I'll just give you a snapshot of a day. We open up – my home store has – we sell plants and flowers. So I was able to open because we do sell to landscapers. So I – we got busy as soon as we opened. Customers want to get out of the house. They're all wearing masks. They're all very polite. Everybody's waiting in line. It was a pleasure. One guy comes in without a mask. He doesn't want to wear a mask. And they tell him he's got to wear a mask. He goes back to Yelp and fries us. He's a doctor and he's he's a surgeon and the mask are baloney and it's over, you know, the whole thing's overblown. The hospitals aren't full. And he goes into this whole tirade. 
to be fair, it was one guy. Yeah, I was going to say, you, you've dealt with bad reviews before. Not like this, though. We're in a difficult time now, for God's sakes. So let's go back uh, to thinking how you think about the, the economy. You mentioned the thing about unemployment and how uh, you hate to see <laughs> how that's reported. They're just statistics. No, no, I don't mind the statistic. What I mind is taking that statistic and saying, this is as bad as the Depression. Well, in terms of the numbers. It is, but the Depression, the world was falling apart. Here, they made stores close for a while. They made businesses close. Right, but here's the thing. I, I think it gets to, this gets to an important point because you said this a couple of times. You have said on the podcast um, that we had as good an economy as we've ever had in January and February. Why in the world wouldn't it just come back to that? And I haven't been able to break through. You're saying that. I think there are a lot of good reasons not to expect that to happen right away. Okay. I'm not saying for sure that's going to happen. I'm just saying that there's reason to be optimistic that it, it, it could be okay. It- but you've asked, you, you asked it, why in the world wouldn't it happen? Well, there, there are some obvious good reasons why it might not happen. How about couldn't it happen? How about how about the guy that, that I, I, I was watching? He says, this is going to take five years to recover from. It's like, oh, give me a break. All right. Again, that's one person. But yeah, I know. It gets back to, could we be a little optimistic? Could we just not? It's back to the doomsday. The, the doomsday fatigue. Could we just try to not make everything the worst possible thing it could possibly be? Could we just say the economy was really good before things went bad? Um, they might come back quickly. There's a lot of pent up demand from people being closed. And, um, you know, could, could we just not make it out to be the worst possible thing in the world? Could we? That's all I'm asking. Lauren, could we just be a little optimistic? That's a great question. I feel like my job as the host of this podcast is to be a buzzkill. Uh, no, to to deal with reality, to to talk about the situation as I perceive it and to think through contingencies. So when I ask you what your thinking is, if you were to have to shut down again, I'm not predicting it. I'm not hoping for it. I'm not expecting it, but I'm saying as a business owner, you need to be prepared for contingencies. Yes, I absolutely am. And I'm telling you, I learned very quickly from just this last one. I just talked to my kid about it yesterday. He goes, Dad, what do we need to get another mortgage for? I go, because it doesn't hurt any. I'll have the money. We can it, it, we can pay off a, a line with it and then just give it back if we don't want it. Like I've, I've learned from this last one. You refer to yourself frequently as a recovering entrepreneur, a holic. Uh, you've given a, a examples, you know, wh- where you you reached too far. It, you know, it, you thought you'd completely recovered, but in the last couple of years, you bought a firehouse that you th- had big ideas for, and then you decided to just sell it. Uh, I'm. Th- you've joked at times that that you're somewhat delusional. No, I said there's a thin line between visionary and delusional, and I've certainly been on both sides of that. So yes, I have been delusional. Is that something that an entrepreneur has to be? I don't know that the word has to be. Um, I don't. I won't speak for everyone. I'll only tell you that one of my friends said after one of my deals didn't work, he goes, "Jay, that's how you got where you're at." I mean, I, I don't. I don't, in my own personal thing, if I didn't have that personality trait, I don't a frame shop with three employees. I mean, that's where I would be. I have 110 employees and four businesses. So I think this is an accurate statement. I don't think you're going to ever talk to a successful entrepreneur that didn't have some things they did along the way. It didn't work. I mean, they don't always work. And, and there's a great book called The Hypomanic Edge that I read 10 years ago. It's written by a psychiatrist or psychologist. And he said, hypomania is by definition, you think you can do anything and you've got self kind. And he went through the whole list of hypomania. And then he went through the whole list of entrepreneurship characteristics. And they're the same list. And I have to tell you, it gave me a window into my soul. And I called the guy and I thanked him. And he said, you're not the first person to call me. So yeah, I recognize now I'm hypomanic. I think I can do anything. And now I think things through a little bit more than usual before I go jumping. Well, well, that's what I wanted to ask you. Do you think this experience, the last three and a half months or whatever it's been with this crisis, has it changed you? 
Not really, because I already figured it out before. I already knew that I didn't need to keep on the fast track and I wanted to just, so, so the only thing, like I said, the only thing that I learned from it is I should have gotten a mortgage on the building and kept the money somewhere. Other than that, I was already off the trying to take over the world thing. My business, I never thought I'd use this phrase. Never, never, never thought I'd use this phrase. My business is big enough. I, I just, I don't need to own a $50 million company. It's fine. Not only fine, I'm happy. It's not about balance at my stage. It's it's about alignment. And I, I would say this at any stage. You figure out what you want. I don't want any more stress because I've got it under control really well before. I mean, things were really just gotten easy. That's why, and for an example, I'm not buying that guy's store. I just, I don't need five more employees. You've I'm- talked a lot on the podcast about you know, you can find opportunities in a, in a moment like this. And you told us about how during the Great Recession, you bought that big uh, warehouse that changed the dynamic of your business. Uh, so you're, you're certainly open to opportunities. And this one, you know, somebody who was closing down anyway, it, initially it looked to you like it could be a really good opportunity. What, what, what changed? Okay, this is what changed, to be fair. I figured out the, 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 the volume he was doing, and I realized to get the volume to where I needed to be, I'd, op- I'd have to open Sundays. It's in the suburbs. It's harder to find help on Sundays. And I realized this isn't going to be as easy as it looks. And frankly, the amount of money I'd make on the store, it just isn't worth it. And and I, that's why I had to think about it. Um, so, so if something else fell into my lap that was fairly simple, I'm not saying I wouldn't do it. But in this case, I had to figure out – there was two issues. One is, could I do enough volume to make the money that would be worth the trouble? And two, this would put a stress on every, it would put a stress on a lot of different things. He's got four older people working there using my computer system over theirs. It's not going to be an easy transition. I just did an assessment and figured out it just isn't worth it. And um, for me, that's quite a, uh, there's no question. 10 years ago, I would have already been there. I that That's quite the uh, change. So I, I am still recovering is the point. It sounds like I haven't really pissed you off yet. Um, no, you've really lost your – yeah, I, I'm, I'm, you've kind of lost your best pitch. Did I miss anything? Oh, I had something just yesterday. Guy goes home from Jason home and he, he writes a Yelp thing with, oh, they're snobby in there. And it's like, what are you talking about? I, you know, it's, it's frustrating. He called and asked for me yesterday to apologize. He said, I came in your store and I realized I was in a really bad mood when I came in there. Did you do anything that prompted that apology or did he just- Yes, actually, we put a response on the Yelp thing, but he actually- That's that's smart. What, what, what did you say in that response? Because there's an art to that. I don't remember exactly. The, the, our typical response is- did, did you argue with him or- No, no, no. I never argue with anybody. I go, I'm sorry you felt- <laughs> Except me. No, except you. Well, that's that's why you're here. Um, I don't- I said, I, I'm I'm horrified you feel that way, and here's who we are and how we got here. And um, you know what? I, I teach my employees, you know, how to save a customer and, you know, S, sympathize. You know, I, I understand. You, you, you should explain that. When you say how to save a customer, you're talking about an acronym, S-A-V-E. Yes, S-A-V-E-S, you know, sympathize. Like, I can understand why you're upset. I mean, wouldn't that make you feel good if you had a problem in a store that they actually understand? And then A is act. If there's something wrong, we say, as soon as you leave, I'm going to call the manager. I'll call the vendor. I'll You do something about it. V is, in our case, vindication of simply saying, we usually catch stuff like this. And then, and this is true, we're really embarrassed this happened. All true. We are embarrassed it happened. And then lastly is eat something if appropriate. Eat free delivery. Eat. What I find is when, when companies mess up, even if you go just pick up dinner and it's messed up, all right, we'll give you a credit. We'll put it in the register. Okay, the credit in the register doesn't make up for the fact that we didn't get French fries with our dinner. It just doesn't do it. I, I mean, if I own that company, I swear to God, I'd stick somebody in a car and I drink, I drive the food to their house. That's what I would do. Um, so, so, so we gave a, a nice message. We never argued with him say and he called me and I said you know what I really appreciate the call you know any good news you get these days is good I the only thing that's gone right lately is I got plenty of toilet paper all right so Jay much earlier in this whole crisis we talked about which businesses are going to make it and which aren't and you came up with a uh, five-part stress test um, that you suggested 
for that any business could use to assess where they stand and their likelihood of of making it through. And, you know, even early on when things were looking bad, you you felt pretty good. You felt like you were in pretty good shape. I'm curious, has anything changed? Do you still pass your own stress test? I feel better, actually, because we're open, we're busy, and I've, I'm paying down. Why don't you take us through the stress test? Okay, so the first question is, how was business before this all happened? I'm suggesting if you were struggling before this, unless something's changed, that's a problem. I mean, my business was going really nicely before this, so that's number one. Number two, what kind of legal obligations do you have to people? Do you have a partner that lives in Boca Raton, the 73, that's calling you screaming, going, I want my money back, close the business down? I don't have any partners. I've, I've got almost no landlords, so I don't have, uh, you know, or vendors you owe a lot of money to. I don't have any of that. So if you've got someone putting the screws to you like that, that's a huge problem. Um, number three, Where's your head at? Maybe you're tired. Maybe you've had enough. Maybe you've got enough money. You don't need to work anymore. Maybe you're just uh, already, maybe you were already thinking of closing your business. So there's nothing wrong with any of that. It's just in my case, I'm not going anywhere. I like going to work every day. I like supporting my employees. I like the whole thing. So I'm as energetic today as I was 20 years ago. Four, do you have any key employees that left during this whole thing. If you have a smaller business, especially, and you've got a key architect or a key salesperson or a key designer, that could be, that could hurt a lot. And I don't have any of that. Everybody that works for me came back. And lastly is what kind of financial resources do you have? Um, Do you have cash in the bank? Do you have credit lines? I know this is weird to the average person, but having cash or having a credit line, same thing, access to capital. Is there any property you can mortgage? I'm in better shape now than I was in six months ago because business is picking up and and I would be the first to admit the PPP thing was a lifesaver. I just want to tell you, it's not called a bailout. I call it, it's a disaster relief is what it was. So, you know, good for the government for doing that and good to everybody that was able to take advantage of it. Jay Goltz, thank you for taking this time. Thank you for letting me rake you over the coals and uh, think this all through again. Thanks for listening, everybody. This episode was produced by Jess Thuberon, founder of Blank Word Productions. Remember, we started the 21 Hats podcast to help business owners feel a little less isolated, to let them know they aren't the only ones fighting these battles. If you got something out of this conversation, please help us reach more people. Tell a friend, subscribe and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Follow us on Twitter at 21 underscore hats. And let me know if you have a question or a comment or a topic you'd like us to cover. My email address is lfeldman at 21hats.com. See you next time.